and the ride starts and you can imagine it's that slow oh yeah 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 as you go up (laughs) and then right on the top there's just this silence and you don't know if you should keep your eyes open or not you're really scared you have no idea what to expect and the next thing your tummy's in your throat and you're screaming and you're praying and you're just hoping to get to the end of it and it just goes whirling and twirling and you are disorientated and then you get off and you say what can say is like Hi everybody, welcome back to another Zen and Now podcast uh, where we explore the journey of wellness, mental health and, and living for today. Today we have a, a, I have the pleasure of introducing Vosha Naran, the driving force behind Lumia. Is that how you say it? Lumia. Lumia. Uh-huh. Like the light, Lumia. Lumia coaching and consulting. Vosha's focus on personal growth and self-discovery is inspired by her courageous battle to, to defeat cancer not once, but twice superhero in my book she's also uh she's also got multiple degrees and is very accomplished in her field of uh, neurolinguistics programming accreditations in various uh, forms mental fitness coach and a certified resilience model trainer and her coaching methodology is both comprehensive and transformative let's dive into it and and you know just learn about this uh tremendous human being story that thank you for joining me on my thank podcast thank you for having me no you're welcome. you're welcome thank you so much for having me it's uh, exciting to be here yes when i when i when i reached out to you i i just like i felt it was the right thing to do because your journey is such a an extraordinary one uh and i you know getting your message out there or getting sharing your story you know could help somebody uh so and i think that's why i reached out to you i feel like we have all all stories to tell and you know just somebody who's struggling out there might just you know reach into this and tap into it and say you know what I'm not alone so thank you for joining me and thank you for sharing your story with me as well i look forward to this i love stories i'm a voracious reader and i actually love reading biographies i love reading about people's lives and i always walk away with the sense of awe of what people can actually go through what the human being is capable of and how much atrocities um has been done and i think will you know continue happening at some point at, at, in, in different places and um stories have been for me this space when i was young to escape and as i grew older it's also the space where i found that wisdom and courage and just a community <laughs> yeah did you did you fully immerse yourself in those like did you like were you into like fantasy or just fictional what was like what was your genre to go to um Sure, growing up, I oh, when I say growing up, I still am a huge <laughs> fan of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> nice. Me too, me too. So I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've been to the Holmes Museum in London, so I mean, you don't get better than that. Um, so I love murder mysteries. I I love um reading books uh about kind of law cases and stories. Books growing up, I loved Enid Blyton books. I'm going to go and want to learn the story of the author. So, I really really love biographies. I want to know what makes people write this beautifully. What where did these ideas come from? How did this wonderful world live inside you or how did you overcome what you've been through? So, um growing up my father really encouraged reading and 
I just recently uh, noticed that my son's reading the same copy of The Pearl by John Steinbach oh, wow. that I read when I was his age. Right. It's the, it's, I think I must have brought it back from South Africa when we moved here and he's picked it up. And it was a beautiful moment because that was a book my dad had given me. And now my son's reading it. And Steinbeck's, you know, again, uh, an amazing author that I've loved reading. I went through a phase last year where I read a lot of books um, of Holocaust survivors. Oh. And that really connected me to just collective suffering. And it puts in perspective what we are going through and what I am personally going through. It really, really puts things in perspective and it allows you to step back and say, wow, this happened in this world. Mm -hmm. And I am okay. What I'm going through is manageable. Yeah. Not to ever compare, right. but it's manageable. And I yeah, think, I think we need more of that. I'm sorry. Some music playing. It's okay. <laughs> we get some vibe going in on the show. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were saying like, I think the Holocaust, I think for me also something about it, just I also like I watch a lot of documentaries and I like, want to understand their stories. I think my wife always says in the past life, I was probably either in that space. I was, you know, either one of the two. So maybe, maybe my soul resonates with them and, you know, just the intriguement, you know, just like, just to understand their story um, yeah. and just to learn from it as well. Cause we all, I mean, take a lesson out of everything in life, uh, whether it be good or bad. And I think, I think I, I agree with you. Like there's always something to learn or take something from not the suffering, but, you know, negative experiences where we can incorporate it into our lives and say, okay, what did I learn from it? And, how can I make it better, you know? Uh, yeah. And then there's that moment of awe, right? Because one of the things that really helps with mental well-being, right, one of the things that we talk about is um, the sense of awe. Right. And being able to be awe-inspired or to, to be um, in a state of awe. And awe can be many things. It can be climbing an amazing, you know, having a really hard hike on Drakensberg and getting to the top and, taking all of that in, yeah. um, but all can also be going down into the depths of somebody else's suffering and understanding what they've been through and that, you know, just the fact that they experience that yeah. is all as well. As a cancer survivor, not once, but twice, um, would you be able to talk me through like your experience and how it felt like, you know, the first time you know, being in remission and then the second and then learning about that you've you've got it again and then going through all of that again i'm sure it must have been just like uh, just a total you know shock to your senses you know if you just give me a, a background or how did you feel yeah. well staying on the theme of stories maybe i can tell you a story so when i was um very young I grew up in a little town called Brits, which didn't have one horse. Maybe it had half a horse. I don't know. But it was a small little town. I remember. And um, Yeah, sure. And once a year, um, the, the circus would come. And once a year, the, the carnival would come. Um, and they would set up this roller coaster. And they would have all these rides. And um, every year being among the youngest, I would beg and plead for my, my cousins, all of them boys, to take me to the carnival with them. And uh, they were not very keen, <laughs> but I guess at some level um, they would take me. So they would agree and they would take me and they would always leave um, one of the cousins in charge of me, Uresh. I don't know if you remember him. And probably, probably um, not. Yeah, well, um, he maybe if I was maybe. in charge of me. Okay. <laughs> Long story short, he was in charge of me. He he, you know, drew the short end of the straw every year. 
And um, he would take me on all the rides, the twister, the teacup, and, you know, all of these baby rides. And one year I said to him, as he looked very longingly at the roller coaster, I said to him, you know what, let's just do it. It's okay. I can be brave. You with me. Let's do it. And so we stand in the queue behind the rest of the cousins and they all get on the ride and they fill the ride up. So we need to wait for the next one. (laughs) (laughs) And the next one comes along and guess what? We are in the first front seat. Right in front. The best seat in the house. That's the scariest place to be. (laughs) It's either you it's either you love the front or you or you or you don't. Yeah, I'm not a fan. Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so we get in and um, I'm this little wafer of a person and so the the bars come up and he's got his hand you know against me because he's not sure this bars are going to be good enough I'm not even sure they had like those seat belt things in those days and the ride starts and you can imagine it's that slow t- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As you yeah. go up. <laughs> the up. And then right on the top, there's just this silence. And you don't know if you should keep your eyes open or not. You're really scared. You have no idea what to expect. And the next thing, your tummy's in your throat. And you're screaming and you're praying and you're just hoping to get to the end of it. And it just goes whirling and twirling, and you are disorientated. And then the ride's over. And then you get off, and you say, no, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what Ken says like. Before we continue with today's episode, if you're enjoying it, if I could ask you for a small favor, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. It will not only help the channel grow, but it will also allow me to bring you a lot more guests and a lot more experiences. Thank you. Back to the show. A roller coaster. It's like a roller coaster ride. Yeah. It's this tuck, tuck, tuck going up from, for me, I felt a lump under my arm and went and had a biopsy done. So it's tuck, tuck, tuck up. And then waiting for the results. And then you sit in the doctor's room and you're sitting there and the doctor says to you, I'll never forget this. He said to me, how do you eat an elephant? How do you, do you know how to eat an elephant, Christian? Yeah. How do you eat an elephant? Probably the most anxiety-driven moment. Right. <laughs> and my doctor walks in and says, how do you eat an elephant? Hmm. So the answer is one bite at a time. And that's how... You go through cancer treatment, one bite at a time, one step at a time, one hour at a time, one minute at a time. You just take it as it comes. And um, that was my journey. So I was 24 years old, the first time I was diagnosed with cancer. And um, I went through um, chemotherapy and um, hormone therapy because my uh, cancer was estrogen positive. And then I continued hormone therapy for another five years um, and just after that moved to Mauritius. And then 10 years later, from my first, 10 years after my first diagnosis, at 35, I was diagnosed with my second um, cancer. Wait, Both of did, them were breast cancer. Okay. You were asking a question. Yeah, I wanted to ask, like, did you were you frustrated when when it returned? Were you angry? Or did you feel like, why, why me again? <sighs> why this again? I was sad. Mm-hmm. I was really, really sad, and I'll never forget. I got my diagnosis from a a surgeon. And she obviously saw that I was crestfallen. So she called my oncologist, who I had by now known for 10 years. 
right. um, and who had been my treating doctor. And um, I sat outside the hospital and uh, in the parking lot waiting for him to come from, I don't know where he was that day, but it, it took him an hour and a half to get to, to me. He was on vacation. Um, and my husband and I sat on a little ledge behind some cars in the parking lot at the clinic. And there were just no words. There was just no words for this. We we were just shocked. I right. remember purple flowers. I remember lots and lots of butterflies everywhere. And I remember this silence. I remember him holding my hand. And I remember saying to him, we have a choice here. Mm -hmm. I can do treatment, but I can also choose not to do treatment. And for me, choice is very important mm -hmm. to know that I am in control of my life, that I have agency, and that I have choices, that mm -hmm. I'm informed. And it was important for me to say that out loud to hear myself saying that. Um, my son was a year and a half at that time. And um, I I wanted to I wanted to see him play music right. in front of a packed audience because he was already showing talent. Right. <laughs> Banging lots of pots. And I wanted to be there when his heart got broken for the first time. Oh, no. And I wanted to track across the country to another country and get him settled into his apartment when he started university. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be there for the small stuff and the big stuff. And that's what helped me make the choice to do treatment. But for me, it was a choice. Right. Um, my cancer had mutated. Um, so it was um, HER2 negative the first time. And then it was HER2 positive the second time, which meant there was a different type of treatment. Um, the cancer was pretty unique in that um, after five years of a cancer diagnosis and survival, your chances of getting cancer again is the same as anybody else. Um, the chances of the same cancer coming back after 10 years and it having mutated to a more aggressive form is a little bit more rare. And um, there isn't a standardized protocol um, in terms of treatment for that. Mm -hmm. But I was very lucky. I had an oncologist here in Mauritius and I had an oncologist in South Africa and both of them are just amazing. Um, and so I felt very taken care of. To come back to your question, did I ask why me? Yes, many times. Who wouldn't? Yeah. I think it's normal and it's natural for us to experience the full range of emotions, right? So the anger, the rage, the frustration, the annoyance, the irritation, the sadness, the guilt, the fear. I think it's normal to feel all of that. And I, I was never judged for it, and I never judged myself for it. Um, because I think for me, I'd always been taught that no matter how many times you fall down, as long as you get up, that's okay. Yeah. So falling down is really life. Life. Yeah. So you, I can just imagine, like, just you know, the pure raw emotion that you go through with something like this. And not just for yourself, I think also for your support structure and people around you that actually are there for you. Uh, how how it's taxing? A lot to hold. Yeah, how taxing was it? You know, on them as well. Um, I think I think very much so. I think from from my side as the person going through it, um, you feel guilt that you are causing your family to go through something. Mm -hmm. um, you, if you are as independent as I am, it's very hard 
to ask for help and to rely on others. Um, and then I think you also want to be strong for them because that's what they expected. Right. And everyone keeps patting you on the back and saying, oh, you're being so strong. Okay. So it seems like the narrative. And then I think the support structure also has this um, burden to be strong for you. And I, I don't know if burden's the right word, yeah. but they feel they should be strong should for be, you. Yeah, yeah. And um, that they don't want to burden you with other stuff. And so it becomes this dance that you start having where everyone's being super cautious of everyone else and everybody's feelings and we just want to, you know, kind of get through this. And it's, it's sad and beautiful at the same time because it's a, it's a pure form of love. love to yes. care so much about somebody else that you keep so much within you. Um, but I think that when somebody is diagnosed with cancer in a home, it's the whole family. Mm -hmm. And if you have an opportunity to support, don't think it's only the, survivor, the, the cancer patient that needs the support. It's also the partner and the yeah, sister yeah. and the mother and the kid. Like it's, it, it takes a village. Yes. I mean, they, we're all connected emotionally. They are feeling as sad. Yeah, they, yeah. they're feeling as sad and anxious as you are. Yeah. No, I, I totally get that. It's We always have this discussion, myself and my wife, and just with other people as well. And like your actions don't just affect you, you know, in, in, in layman's terms. It like, it, it's a ripple effect down to everybody else. And sometimes I feel like I've been guilty of this. Like, you know, sometimes you be, you, you were selfish in a way and, you don't really think about your actions. You think, oh, okay, it's just going to be affecting me. Um, but afterwards, after you like go through that entire process and then you see like your relationship starts to break with those that actually you thought they were there for you, but weren't and uh, not actually, you know, and what you think is, is support is not actually support anymore. And then mm -hmm. it's a beautiful way of, of how people, you actually don't expect to be your support structure, become your support structure, mm -hmm. you know? And I think also we growing up in brown communities, we were always just taught like your family is everything. And those are the people that will support you through thick and thin. And sometimes it's, it's heartbreaking when, when there isn't that expectation met, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And then you get people who are just out of the pureness and goodness out of their heart, just, just give you what you need at that moment in time. And you're like, ah, yeah. okay. You know, moments, that moment is just, yeah. you have to just reflect on it and, you know, acknowledge it and acknowledge them as well. Mm. I think that's one thing that cancer really gives you is perspective on community and support. Mm -hmm. Because the person you go, so if you, for example, go for chemotherapy every third Thursday in a month, you inevitably are going to be sitting in the same chair and inevitably there's somebody else that's going to be sitting to the right of you and in front of you and to the left of you. And inevitably you start talking and they also become part of your support structure. And when somebody comes to visit you, they visit them as well. And, you know, it's a whole community that gets formed. But I think globally, People come together when they're suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, thinking of family as just your immediate family um, in itself can be limiting. Yeah. I think family is a, mm -hmm. family is a sort of a, how do you say, I'm looking for the word to say, uh, how do you want you to describe family as not just your immediate family, but it's like a, it's like a global word, you know, family can be anything, friends, colleagues, doesn't matter. Define it. Yeah. I think that's exactly it. Like you define what family is. Yeah. And I, I appreciate yeah. like, and I think when somebody has gone through a traumatic event, then they, they maybe get better at setting boundaries and creating that sense or definition of what family is. 
so important you say boundaries when you go through a traumatic event. It's like, why do we need to go through those events to actually understand what setting boundaries are, you know? Uh, Socialization, right? Yeah. <laughs> Like I never learned all of this growing up and, you know, now understanding that I didn't set certain boundaries in life and there were people took advantage of me and, you know, all the, mm -hmm. I didn't stand up for myself when I should. And, but like you said, socialization, uh, socialization, uh, when you're in it, you're in the vortex, it's, it's, you're there, you don't really, you don't really see any pers other perspective but when you come out of that mm -hmm. and you see things from a from an objective and different perspective i think you yourself will know when it's right to like okay take certain actions and but you also have to be the one to acknowledge that something was right and something something's worked and some things didn't mm -hmm. and i think you're picking on two very important things right stories that we are what we are and where we are as a result of the stories we have lived. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of us have transformed our traumas to become better people and to engage better with this world. And if we didn't have that as horrible as it sounds, yeah. it might have taken us longer to get here. Um, and the other part is around self-accountability, right? Or self-regulation in a way where we understand that we are an integral part of this world and our actions or non-actions have an impact. Yes, yes. That's, I think I love that. That's a, such an important point to, to note that we are on this planet for a purpose. Like, as much as we, we won't want to acknowledge it at times or we're too afraid to acknowledge it, but stepping into that power is, like you say, an awe moment, you know? When you get to step into that power, it's like when I went through my own uh, traumatic experience of, of uh, being diagnosed with, with major depression and, and anxiety and then being booked into the hospital for two weeks, that gave me perspective, okay, I have, I have a purpose in life and I can either use this opportunity to do something or I can I can dwell and sit in the darkest deep depths of of the hole, you know. And I took the latter of it. I mean, I took the opportunity mm -hmm. to say my story can help somebody else, and that's that's I think my purpose on this planet. You transformed your trauma. Yes. It's wonderful to be able to connect to who we authentically are, because I think as as little kids we know. And somewhere along the line, conditioning, life, whatever, it gets buried somewhere. Mm -hmm. And then we feel a bit like a lost penny. And we look all over the world trying to find ourselves. But you're not a lost penny. You just need to go and unearth the layers again. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And connect back with who you authentically are. And it's not, it's not passion. I, I, I don't, you, you'll forgive me, but I don't think it's, it's passion. I think it's authentic connection to what is meaningful to you, to how you make meaning in this world and how you create meaning for others by right. being in this world. I like that. <laughs> it's a different perspective. I like that. Thank you. Yes, sir. So this journey, what made you, with going through these kind of traumas, what was your, what was the moment when you began Lumiere and where did Lumiere come from? How did it all begin? Oh, um, so I had been in corporate for a long time. I'd spent most of my career um, in human resources, specifically in, in OD. So working with leaders, working with people. And honestly, after my first cancer, I, I knew that I was called for something different. And things just didn't work out. Or maybe I didn't pursue it or the universe didn't put things in the right way. It was only after my second cancer that I really 
aggressively pursued um, connecting to helping others and being able to bring my value in a more tangible way. Right. Um, and so I had already been doing coaching um, and training in in organizations as part of my job in OD. And Lumiere was a natural progression to do that. So the story of Lumiere, even though I'm English speaking, is, is very interesting. Lumiere means light. And that's because in all the years I had been in human resources working with different types of people, what I realized is that fundamentally we are all this beautiful white light that's pure, that we all want to be happy, we all want to be joyful, we all want peace, we all want healthy bodies and great relationships. We all want the same thing. So fundamentally, we all want the same white light or we all made of that light. And then we go through this prism that we call life and life experiences. And then, you know, that just results in this rainbow of colors of yes. how we actually show up in the world. Yes. But if we, we as human beings paused to look beyond the spectrum, beyond the refraction, beyond the colors that are showing up or the behaviors of people, if we looked for their positive intention, we would go back and would connect to their white light. And we would be able to leave the judgment behind. All we need is curiosity. All we need to ask ourselves is, huh, I wonder what's going on here. I wonder why this person who wants joy and peace and health and happiness, just like me, is behaving in this way. And if we're curious enough, we can find those positive intentions. We can find that white light and we can connect better. So, so this is how Lumiere was born. Amazing. I love that story of, you know, inside out, you know, the, the certain colors of, of the emotion and how, like when you said, like we all have this, this certain amount of white light, but we also have all the colors within us to express, you know, yeah. how we're feeling. And um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's amazing. Like, thing... No, go ahead. You go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, you touched on emotions and Inside Out. Also, my most, my favorite cartoon. I hope you watch Inside Out too. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you must. You must. Yes. Um, but on, on speaking about emotions, what I did realize was that um, at some point in my life, I was tired. I was mm. tired of being anxious and I was tired of being fearful. And I was tired of being sad and I was just tired of fighting. Right. There's, you know, just so much, right? Yeah, there's so much. And so do. I thought, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done with emotions. I'm done. I do not want to experience negative emotions anymore. And so I closed myself off to it. And what I realized a few, many, maybe not a few, but many years later, is that when we close ourselves off to negative emotions, we also close ourselves off to experiencing positive emotions, right? So you close yourself off to experiencing joy and splendor and wonder and love and caring and all of these amazing emotions. emotions. And so you come to a point in your life where you realize that there isn't fundamentally good or bad emotions, there's emotions yeah. and there's how we respond to them. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's in our response where our power is, right? So we will experience something based on our response. Yes. And there's a lot of grace that comes in that grace for ourselves, which is not always so easy. Only going through working and working on myself, did I actually learn that I have two options? Whereas if, if I, Mm. Probably didn't look, go deep within myself. I don't think I would be here. We're speaking about it right now. I'll be probably like further along the line, you know, maybe later on in life. Yeah. So I think that there's yeah. certain moments in life where you you take and you're like, okay, this is where I need to be right now, and I have 
I have choices, like you said. Exactly. I think choices are so liberating and anger is a very special emotion, right? Like some people say, um, Brene Brown, for example, <laughs> believes that anger is a secondary emotion, right? So it's masking maybe shame, maybe fear, maybe hurt, um, sadness. And so when we, when we experience the anger, there's a moment there where we can pause and ask ourselves what's really behind this, yeah. what's driving this anger. And anger in itself is also an emotion that demands action. Right? It's a very forceful emotion. And if we're not able to step back, we're not able to identify what's the emotion driving it. And we're not able to identify what is the need of that emotion. So maybe the need is comfort. Maybe the need is understanding. Maybe the need is love. Maybe the need is silence. Maybe the need is to set a boundary. Maybe the need is an expression of something. Right. If we remain hooked in the emotion, it becomes hard for us to actually hear what the emotion is trying to tell us. Yeah, we and need to listen to as well, right? We need to listen to, our, yeah. listen to our emotions, not just feel it as well. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. No, that's, yeah. uh, it's a hard work to, to become a better person. I think it's, it's, uh, it's very challenging. It's very emotional, very draining, like you said. Um, but it's also a beautiful story. It's a beautiful journey. I like, now I enjoy the journey instead of just the destination because I know there's so much more, you know, to, to love for right now instead of tomorrow yeah. or love yesterday. Yes, sometimes it's, it's hard to forget the past. Uh, but there's now we've, we've gained the tools to accept it and manage it in a, in a more calmer way where it's like before it would just be like panic attacks and anxiety and, you know, just all out fear. But now fear becomes uh, a lesson instead of just uh, an experience, so to say. Yeah. Well, I, it sounds like you've done a lot of nervous system regulation work. Oh, no, I have. It's breath work, uh, trauma, uh, you know, trauma logging, uh, all of those things. Uh, yoga, meditation, I've, yeah. I've, I've gotten down the path of just trying to understand why my traumas happened mm -hmm. and what do they mean? And mm -hmm. they make me who I am today. Yeah. They all part yeah. of me. Absolutely. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to discard any of it. What happened to me has happened. And I'm, I'm grateful for all the experiences that I've gone through school, high school, university, adolescence, whatever it is, something was there to, to guide me, you know, to where I am today. And who knows what, what, what tomorrow holds. And, but today we live for today, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think um, when we discard it, when we deny it, when we suppress these experiences, they have a tendency to leak out. Mm -hmm. and to leak out in the most inappropriate ways and the most inappropriate times. Um, one thing I have learned is that um, I've stopped being so entangled in fixing myself and, you know, getting to the destination of where I'm okay. Um, it's, it's more about this is what I'm experiencing now and I'm a little bit tired of all these self-help books, so I'm going to just take it easy for a while and go and do a class in pottery, or I'm just going to, you know, read a couple of books right. and just not have to feel like I need to transform things all the time or I need to work on myself all the time. I think one of the things that we do when we've been through a traumatic event is that we feel like we need to work on it. We need to work on it. And I think we discount the power of just resting and allowing it to work, whatever we've done, to work inside us um, and to allow that space for the work to happen without there having to be a verb involved of action. Yeah. So just being. Do you, do you struggle to do nothing? 
Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I am always in sixth gear. <laughs> but is that in itself putting way too much pressure? Like just because somebody somewhere says we need to just be okay with just being? Eh, right? <laughs> Um, our realities are, are really different and what we are going through is different and everybody's traumas and the way they experience it is different. So why do we expect that we need to fall into this model definition of what being is? Um, you know, if that fidget toy helps you, or if you want to take up finger knitting, you know, that's also really nice to do in front of the TV. Um, that's That's okay. For me, one of the most liberating things to do was to learn that meditation doesn't mean that I need to be seated on the mm. ground, sitting still. No, 100%. But actually that I could be doing Qigong or Tai Chi or yoga, or I could be walking somebody, you know, on the beach. That in itself is a meditative experience. So discovering that was for me amazing in my 20s to realized that I had been putting so much pressure on myself to conform to this definition of what being is. Right. Um, when I'm not, I'm a non-conformist, right? Like my, my mentor is, or my mentor, my hero, the person I look up to is Vincent van Gogh, right? Oh, it's my, uh, if you want to talk about taking the path less traveled, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, we've yeah. actually just we've we've gone to his uh, his because Toronto has uh, an exhibition of his uh, of his work. Is it the most expensive? Yes, yes, we've been to that. Oh, and, I'm so jealous. <laughs> yeah, that was something else. Like, and there's this this one room where it's just uh, it's electronic, but his artwork is displayed by projection, and you just sit in the middle of the room to just like you say, you know, have those awe moments. And it's just the way he depicts his art is just it's just all inspiring and it's just that's what I mean, like just sitting and doing that like that's an experience. That's a, a nothing moment. But you're taking it in. You know? You know, you take you take it exactly, like you're taking those moments in and for me exercise is is my meditation. Uh when I'm on when I'm on my bike ride, that's meditation for me. Uh when I'm exercising That's being yeah, that's that's just being right. But I feel like I don't know. It's it's just something that I probably need to like be a bit more mindful of. It's okay just to be on the couch and okay using your hands. That's okay. I don't need to put too much pressure on myself, like you said. And thank you for sharing that. Uh, it's a different perspective, and I'll I'll definitely keep that one in mind going forward. I think we experience things. And I think um, I've been working on myself for so many years that you hear so much that at some point you start questioning everything. Mm -hmm. And when you reach that point where you start questioning everything, that's when the soul is empty. That's when you start connecting to who you really are and what is really meaningful to you and accepting that. Yeah, acceptance is the big word. I think that's what true power is. Yeah, acceptance yeah. Is, the, is the word. Yeah. To, just to be yourself. I think we, we, we try and be so many, so many characters in, in so many people's lives yeah. that we, we sometimes don't just accept ourselves for who we are and we try to and it's many. a daily acceptance, right? Yeah, hundred percent. Not just not just for yourself, but for where whatever you're doing or wherever you're going and whoever you're interacting with, you know, just accepting yourself. Yeah. And it's a, it's a journey. It's a challenge. Every single day is you wake up and there's new challenges in front of you. But we know that when you go through something traumatic, you have the tools. So I'm like, I struggle like some days to ask for help because I think I can solve all the problems or just manage tasks for myself. And at times I just got to be like, uh, uh no, it's time to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. when it's like, why didn't I do this earlier? <laughs> you know, 
but mm -hmm. it's 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 learning learning those those moments every single day it's a reframing as well right mm -hmm. where I think in many ways we get shame with asking for help because it's indicative of a failure perhaps that you need to ask for help and so reframing help being community building help being um care a form of care and a form of love um any help is a form of showing the other person that you trust them and that you believe that they have value and they can add value to you as you will add value to them so there is that and i think i don't know if it's it's something that is a female thing um but asking help as a woman is also makes you weak Right. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah. It's the the old narrative. Yeah. Exactly. And so you know you kind of don't want to be seen that way. Mm -hmm. Um. And again, it takes a village, right? Um. If I am where I am today, it's because I've stood on the shoulders of other women. Right. Um. When I was down, it was my sister that lifted me up. You know. Mm -hmm. And um. Very often, if we just opened ourselves to the possibility of it we don't even need to ask it comes yeah the universe provides when you need it the most yeah yeah has your has your has your you village finished. yeah has your village grown smaller has my village grown smaller or tighter i think tighter. yeah i think so i was gonna say all i think lots of in the times we live, mm -hmm. I think lots of people's villages are getting smaller because, you know, we've, if I think of my family, there's four of us and two of us are not even in the country. Mm -hmm. So that village became smaller, right? Um, has it become tighter? Most definitely. Absolutely. Um, I've become quite ruthless about mm -hmm. in my village, the people right. I care about. The people I care about, I care about fiercely. And I would go to the end of the earth for them. And I know they would do that for me too. And that's been a great comfort to me. Um, is that because of trauma? Is that because of just life? I don't know. I think it's, I think it's, just, I think it's just awareness of who you want in your village. I think it's just yeah. accepting, like, okay, I don't... And then it's it's energies for me. It's energies. Who do I want? Yes. Which energy do I want in my yeah. village, right? And which which don't I want? Um, and thankfully, my my well, wife has taught me this, and I give her kudos to that because she's taught me so much about boundary boundary setting, energies, personalities. You know, and I'm the kind of person that just will will make a conversation with anybody. You know, and that's me. Like. And she's a totally opposite. She like kind of like suss you out a little bit, and then, okay, you'll be my, you'll be my in part of my group now. But if you if you just totally off the batch, no. Whereas it takes me a little bit more time, uh, and I think that's where everybody's different in their in their timing of how they how they do things. Mm. And that's a complementary aspect, right? Yeah. Of being in a couple as well. So. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. So moving from South Africa to Mauritius, how did that, how did that move actually come about, and why did you feel Mauritius was a place for you for you to move to? Oh, <laughs> that's a story as old as time. <laughs> My husband is Mauritian, okay, and um, so we we decided to just, um, I guess, move back. For him, back home, uh, it was a easy choice. Who wouldn't want to live in an island paradise? Um, so yeah, we've made it work. Amazing. And and your son, uh, he's grown up uh, both in South Africa and and Mauritius. Okay. Oh, he was born there. He was born in Mauritius. Okay. Um, and he he's he's quite close with the family in South Africa because we. 
since his birth, we make sure we go back to South Africa at least once or twice a year. Okay. Yeah, so, it's not too far. And then with yeah. technology, it's easy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're not too far as well. <laughs> Whereas us, it's like two flights, two flights, 24 hours. It's, it's a bit of a distance. Yeah. But thankfully, <laughs> but thankfully for, for technology, we still be able to, we're still in contact with people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's a saving grace. When I moved to Mauritius, um, we were still using Blackberries. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe um, <laughs> no WhatsApp. <laughs> um, you know, there was still the dial up tone. Dial -up phone. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, no, no, the dial-up tone when you connect it to the internet. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Mail. Yeah. I must that, that sound, actually. <laughs> even, yeah. though it, even though tedious as it was, it was, an, it was... It was hard. Yeah. But it was like showing, like, okay, I've got technology now. <laughs> and then you knew when a telephone call was coming as well. That's how yes. you knew. Your speakers would play that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I say Gen Z, but <laughs> mill uh, uh, millennials will understand. Gen Z won't understand that. Yeah. <laughs> no. No, I'm saying the reason I like I reached out to you because I've always wanted to understand your story and learn about it. Um, and I know there's people out there who's actually probably going through something similar, or if not the same as you, and can take some form of strength from it as well. Um, and I just want to thank you for sharing your story, and it's truly inspiring. Thank you. That's very touching to hear. I, I don't think I've done anything different to what anybody else in my place would have done. No, you've done plenty. You've done, some... you've done plenty. <laughs> Trust me, you've done plenty. <laughs> I think sometimes something knocks at your door. And... Except, except it. Except it. You've done plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to take that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but yeah, I think um, it's it's humbling to to meet you as well to um, to have this conversation and um, to to hear about your journey. So thank you. No, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. But I think we've just uh, run out of time and. I just want to say thank yes we could talk on forever we could go on forever <laughs> but no thank you Varsha. Uh, i really appreciate you taking the time and accepting my invitation i hope we can uh, you know reconnect and have another discussion in the in the future anytime this and please, wonderful yes and come visit us in canada absolutely yes two flights and i'm there <laughs> <laughs> No, amazing. Thank you, Vasha. You take care. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye.